when you look at these singers who are so tiny in stature, these petite people, whether it's Andrea McArdle, who was a child and could belt. Sandy Faison was on the show last week. Uh, Sandy Faison played the original role of Grace on the original production of Annie on Broadway. And she was saying that when Andrew McArdle was put into the role of Annie, she could, she could belt and she was the, you know, louder than anything she'd ever heard and she could stay on pitch and, you know, it, and it sounded great. But she, no, but nobody knew how that big sound came out of that little body, you know. And Idina Menzel, you know, uh, you know, these are petite people and it's, it's just, you know, when you talk about freaks of nature, how would you know if you have no vocal training as of yet and you want to do theater, how do you know that you could be a, a really great belter or a really good opera singer if only you got some training? Well, let's yeah. face the obvious here. You have to see what their level of talent, God-given talent is, and trainability with the talent, you know. What are you looking for? when you talk about trainability? Well, I mean, I'm looking for the God-given quality of the voice and then, and then train that. Uh, I mean, you can, you can train a lot of people, but you can train a lot. You could train a person who's not talented for 15 years, and they may be able to do it all right, but it still might not sound very good. You know, <laughs> let's, let's talk about God-given talent now. Then that doesn't mean that that doesn't have to be trained. But it doesn't mean that training in itself, no matter what length of time and no matter how good the teacher, is going to produce, uh, you know, an effective and beautiful and communicative and expressive result. Of course, we could talk about this all day long. Uh, I, ha I do have a couple more questions that people sent in, mm -hmm. um, if we can address those really quickly. And this is for anybody. Anybody can just jump on in there. If you are not in position to go back to college, especially for financial reasons or distance, the commute is too long, but you want a certification or some kind of training and voice so that you can go on and teach. What kind of programs can you recommend? I Like there's the still method, the somatic that I think, Wendy, your, your belting partner <laughs> created. Um, yeah, can, can, you, um, can you guys talk about what kind of um, programs or certifications there might be that somebody could go and and, and take workshops and get certified as a voice teacher? You know, some level of education is really important. And uh, it's, it's a hard situation if, if they're not able to be, be at a place where they could do a college education. Certainly some of the, you know, Jeannie Levetri's, um somatic voice workshop is a great way to learn about, you know, contemporary commercial music. But I think if you're going to train somebody's instrument, I think it is really important that you get some really good courses under your belt, have some education on vocal pedagogy, some of the history behind it, be, get exposure to different types of voices. Mm -hmm. And I don't know of a lot of places, a lot of places where you're just going to get a certification and being able to teach voice. Um, now, sometimes people teach voice who come from a performance background, and, and maybe um, Linda could speak a little bit more about this, but the majority of them have extensive performing careers, mm -hmm. which are sometimes their credentials, and oftentimes they've had extensive training as well. Mm -hmm. Do you want to speak to that, Linda? Well, yes, and that, that's a very valid route to go. However, you're not going to be able to have that accredited piece of paper of which you speak. Uh, right. You can certainly get some very, very good training if you want to take private lessons and, and study with someone who's had a long-term career and or teaches on a faculty and, you know, has done the pedagogical work. But if you, if you are talking about, therefore, then getting some sort of certification or, credit, or, or credit, accreditation, I don't think there's much set up for that. I agree with Wendy. So, Linda, what about somebody who is maybe 35, 40 years old? And I've read about some of these um, singers and uh, classical singer and in opera news where there were people in their, their late 30s, early 40s and just starting an opera career. And they, they've done musical theater all these years and they've noticed the voices changing um, and they want something or they perceive that singing opera will be less strenuous on the voice than singing musical <laughs> theater. <laughs> Um, how do how can people make that transition, or how can they just train correctly the whole time? When you see that happening, it's because they have the instrument. They have the God-given instrument. Yes, they've had training, and they may have enough body savvy 
to quickly understand what to do differently if they've already been Broadway singers. Um, but you, you have to have the instrument. If at 35 and 40 you, you, you hear of somebody who's now singing opera and two years ago they were singing Broadway. Don't yeah. you agree, Wendy? I completely agree. I actually, I, I'm, I'm trying to think of if I know of anybody or have heard of anybody that's really done that extensively. I've heard it going the other way sometimes, but I don't, I don't typically hear of the music theater folks moving then into opera. You know, you'll hear of a truck driver or whoever was on uh, American I was Idol. thinking of Ben. I was thinking of Ben Hepner uh, too when I was thinking of that because he was, you know, he was a truck driver and now he's you know, this he has world the famous. You know, right. He had, a, he had a bucket load of talent. And somebody just led him correctly. I mean, yep. Come on. <laughs> right. Well, see, I, you know, Leontine Price is from Mississippi, and so there, you, everybody um, who, of course, studies opera at least down here, you know, you, they know the story that she was a maid, and the either the um, the lady of the house or her yes. best friend happened to hear Leontine Price singing while she was doing some house cleaning, and she got her in touch with with some people for an audition, and. And lo and behold, you know, fast forward, you know, she's this world famous opera singer nowadays. And, you know, it's just amazing. It's like being in the right place at the right time, but having this, the natural instrument. So if you don't have the natural instrument, you don't have it, can't have an invented interchangeable parts yet for the human body, um, per se, where we can't just, oh, I want these vocal folks today and I want these tomorrow. And I want Barbra Streisand every other day, you know. So you don't have the natural talent, but you have the passion. Mm-hmm. And so the passion is go- is what's going to get you through the work that you are going to have to put into it. What can people who don't have the, the natural ability do? What Are there exercises? I think are there they have they to recognize read? that whatever their talent is, is going to uh, lead them into what they can do and what training is. What's the word I want? Uh, going to be useful because I don't want to say one is limited by one's talent, but one's talent does dictate how far training will take you. And you know, I right. think I, I, I don't say one should not then go ahead and train and, and grow the voice. There have been some wonderful uh, discoveries of voices who are just dogged about training, but the talent will will dictate in a sense just what they can and can't train into. Right. I'm in I'm yeah, I'm in real agreement with that and I think that occasionally that voice teachers sometimes do students a disservice in misleading them to believe that passion alone is going to get them where they want to be. Absolutely. Right. Um I think right. it's part of the job of a teacher you know, when I assess a student or if I have somebody come in and, and they're truly asking for my opinion, not this is like in my private studio setting as opposed to in my office. I don't make judgments about people's talent in my office. That's not my job there. But when students come in my private studio, um, you know, there is the question of do you have what it takes? And I think sometimes those discussions are hard, but they need to be frank. I think it's a terrible disservice to the student and what a waste of money. Absolutely. Now, that doesn't mean they can't right. sing as an avocation or we can't right. put them in places. There's a million places for people to be able to sing, but um, if they are truly planning on doing this as a career, sometimes I don't have to do it because they go to college auditions and that does it for them. But I think that that should, <laughs> I think that, I think that, that should happen before, you know, that's a crushing for the student but as long as you've had the conversation and they continue to do it that's a different story but um you know i think that you have to have those conversations at some point now what about for um this is another question that um people have sent in um when you're training for a vocally strenuous role this is not just vocally intense but you're the role, um, for some reason, the people who created the role put uh, <laughs> the singer having to do things like growling and the kind of grit and steady kind of growling kind of things. Like clearing the throat to me is just the, the worst thing that somebody can do. And it's like, oh, no, don't do that. You're hurting yourself. You're ruining your voice. Don't do that. You know, but when you're required to do that in a role, how do you do those kinds of things 
safely. Because I've got a friend of mine in Ohio who is about to audition for a uh, production of Sweeney Todd, and he wants the role of Sweeney Todd. And that's not the most vocally beautiful role. And so everything that you would learn, you just sing nicely, you know, in your voice lessons, you know, he's got to have, he's going to have to do some other things to pull off the performance. So how, how do you deal with a vocally strenuous role? Um, if I, from my perspective, and I see this not just in music theater, but I see it a lot of my rock singers, like, how do we scream healthy? Because I know you're going to do it, so let's find the, um, let's, let's find the best way to do it. Um, you know, there are some things, growling, sounding a little gruff at times. Those things are vocally exciting to listen to sometimes, but they are not vocally healthy. So what we do is we talk about finding moments of that as opposed to making the entire show about that. Because where right. you start to get into problems, people start to go crazy for the voice that they hear. If they hear that growl or they hear that whatever that signature vocal sound might be for that person or that character, and when the actor or the singer hears that or the hears the audience respond to that, the tendency is, ooh, let me do more of this. <laughs> right, and what you have to do is you have to find those moments, not do it through the entire song. Um, so, and like things like hard glottal attacks, which are used right. quite commonly, um, you can fake a hard glottal attack by essentially doing a really good staccato. It sounds almost the same, but it's a heck of a lot healthier for your voice. Um, you know, I will go through my rock singer's repertoire with them and say, okay. Let me hear exactly what you're doing, and then, you know, let's pick three moments in this song where I'm going to let you growl. The rest of the time, you've got to find some other thing to do vocally so that you don't <laughs> kill yourself and you can perform for the next 15 years. You know, I worry about the American soul singers. I'll just tell you that. American I, what singers? I worry about... I worry about them simply because when they get onto American Idol, it seems that you know, they go for these big, belty type of songs. Now, what happens when the show is over for the season, but they're now famous? So the audiences, when they perform, they, the audiences want to hear all these big songs that they belted and did all their stage histrionics through. And so they're going belt, big belt, belt song over and over and over again. And so when they do a concert of song after song after song where everything's belting or in a belting or in the mixed range or something, that they're not going to have a voice in, exactly. in, in five years. You know, you I don't take, know how they make it through a concert. Yeah. If you take the belt too high, you just can't continue to do that without, it, without screaming. And, and uh, you, you can listen to some singers and know exactly what they have been doing wrong and almost say, well, he's got another four months of singing left to his life or mm, maybe two more years of this and then they're going to have to become an accountant or something. I mean, you, you can't, it, it's going to cost you. You never want to sing on your capital. You just don't right. want to sing on your capital. Well, that's what um, a friend of mine told me when you know, I was like, I want to get back to coloratura. I really want to sing it. And uh, he said, look, he said, coloratura, it's like, it's like the Bahamas. It's a place you visit, but you don't live there. <laughs> he said, so during a concert or during a recital or something, you need to sing other things. And, of course, my response is, but those are boring, regular soprano songs. I don't want to sing those. I want the coloratura. And he said, no, <laughs> you're not going to do that. So you know, if you're it, it, smart it, about what you choose, if you're smart about the repertory you say no to, and I said no to much more than I said yes to, if you're smart about what you choose and what you say yes to, you can have such longevity. And yes, right. it is sad if the music you love isn't music you can sing well. Well, I, I was I loved lyric roles, and so I was I was happy. But you know, I can appreciate what it must be like to want to sing certain repertory and your voice isn't built for it. But if you want a long-term career. You you'll choose what's healthy for the voice and to do healthy singing. If you want to be a rock singer, you're just going to have a short career because you know <laughs> the, the microphone doesn't help them. The microphone that they use uh, isn't saving them from singing wrongly. It's still exactly. Them. It's just amplifying everything they're doing wrong. Mm -hmm. Yep. So and there so are strategies. There are strategies that are used for. You know, concert tours and things like that. Um, you know that are that are used on concert tours and things like that, so that 
some of these singers learn to preserve their voices. Um, you get a good sound engineer. You exactly. track. Uh, I mean, if, if you really want to get into people that are doing eight rock shows a week, mm, we probably need to talk about how they're getting through. And, uh, you know, if you go back to something like American Idol, I mean, some of the voices that we hear, and I haven't listened to the whole show this season, but I've seen bits and pieces of it, and certainly previous seasons, a lot of these people have had significant vocal issues by the time they're done with the show, let alone I've heard some people that are hoarse before they even start this show. Mm-hmm. So, you know, the other thing is that I hate to say, and we don't want to necessarily end the show on this, so you have to think of something else to end the show with. But, um, <laughs> In my in my line of work, I can tell you that it's not always the healthiest voice that gets hired. It's very often the unique voice that gets hired, and um, they may not have perfectly smooth, straight vocal folds to do what they do. And it's that little something, not just in the music theater world, but also in the classical world, that makes them hireable and desirable in the professional world. So... Um, as long as their instrument is functioning for them to do eight shows a week or however many operas they need to do in a week, and they're not having problems, we leave it alone. Yep. I, I, th- I think most people don't even know the kinds of vocal um, pathologists or vocal teachers and vocal um, rehabilitation specialists that are at the disposal of these per- performing professionals. And, you know, it, they, we were talking earlier about how, um, you know, there may be eight Broadway shows a week, but the swings might take two of them so that the Broadway performer may not actually perform all eight performances in a week. And so um, people around the country, they see that, okay, Broadway has eight shows a week, and then you want to go do a Sweeney Todd or a Rand or you want to do, you know, your, at your local community theater. But, you know, the community theater level, they don't have swings. So it is you. If you have that role, it is you singing in rehearsal, you know, three hours of rehearsal, four times a week, and then production week. And, you know, by Friday opening night, you're just horses can be because you've oversung and you don't have that relief. Mm-hmm. Um, right. So I think when people look to Broadway and, the, and professional musical theater, they need to also understand they have a lot of resources at their disposal. Hence, the need for proper training <laughs> to maintain that really? proper training, you know. Uh, so, Linda, um, I guess it is time to wrap up, although I'm having a great time. Um, do you have any final thoughts of what you would like to share on the topic of vocal training? Well, I think if those, there are those out there who are considering, do I really need this? Do I really need this? Can't I just cut to the chase and sing some songs well? I really don't think if you are in the hands of a knowledgeable uh, a really good teacher who cares about your longevity, I don't think you'll ever regret it. And I think you'll have so many gains from it. You'll learn to demystify sound making. You'll learn how you can experiment with your instrument healthily, how you can get different sounds. Y- y- you'll learn how to, how to have power and strength, and uh, you'll learn how you can sing to 4,000 people without a microphone. And then, my gosh, everything's downhill from there. <laughs> Come on. <laughs> <laughs> so I don't think you'll ever regret it. I don't think you'll Wendy, ever regret it. Wendy, and do you I, have any final thoughts on vocal training? Well, I would certainly agree with Linda, and I think that vocal training is imperative and in whatever genre you sing, whether it's music theater or classical classical and rock or whatever it may be, I think you have to train the instrument physiologically. And um, there are strengthening exercises aside from just vocalese that we can even do for the respiratory system and the phonation system. I mean, very specific strength training exercises for those muscles and specific devices that have been manufactured and that exists so that you can physiologically train the muscles and then artistically train the instrument as an artist so that you can do what you want to do um, and make the crossover. I strongly believe in cross-training the instrument, especially if you're doing things that are outside the classical realm, um, that you learn how to do both things. I think it's very important. Absolutely. Absolutely. Well, to wrap up here, I, I definitely want to thank um, Linda Zogby and uh, Wendy LeBorn for being on the show. Y'all are amazing. I hope that you'll want to come on the show again at some point. 
Um, and to the listeners out there, I just want to let you know that the website for Musical Theater Talk is quite simply musicaltheatertalk.com. And just to wrap up, I think the two things we want to say is get proper training and find a good teacher. Well, thank you, Linda. Thank you, Wendy. And thank you, everybody, for listening. It was just a pleasure, Wendy and Trish. Thank it, you. It was. It was very fun and enlightening. <laughs> okay, cool. And then we'll do it all again sometime. But uh, thank you, everybody, for listening. Y'all take care and check out the website, musicaltheatertalk.com, because I'll have the information on the next show and the, a future guest. Thanks so much, and we'll see you next time.